My dear sisters and brothers, I greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you for the honor of sharing in this Eucharistic worship with you. I do want to assure you of our affection and prayers at this time when your church has to consider the recommendations of the recent meeting of the primates of our communion. I hope you won't be too much like the little girl who said to her priest father, Daddy, why do you always kneel just before preaching your sermon? I'm asking God to help me preach a good sermon, darling. Darling retorts, and why doesn't he? <laughs> At the end of the liturgy, the deacon says, go forth in peace to love and to serve the Lord. For we have then received first the gift of God, nothing less than the very life of God communicated to us in and through the thoroughly mundane, the bread and the wine. Only then, fortified and blessed in this manner, are we exhorted and expected to go forth to serve the Lord? The sequence is crucial. First, the grace. First, the divine initiative. And then our response, our Eucharistic response our response in thanksgiving for what God has already done. It has always been meant to be so. God forever taking the initiative. And so God calls an Abraham who is blessed in the calling and who then moves out to live out what is his response to the divine, the unearned, unearnable gift in the call to be God's friend, the response of faith to leave his native land. For God encounters Moses at the burning bush, and everything afterwards is the response, reaction to the divine invitation. God acting first, not waiting for the recipient of God's grace to prove herself first as worthy, God risking being rebuffed, God risking an inadequate response. It is so with the prophets, with the priests in the Old Testament. None presumes to take on this vocation 
Some are challenged to prove that they have indeed been called. No one says the epistle to the Hebrews takes on this high calling of being preached on their own. And so the apostles who had to be called, I have chosen you, says Jesus. You have not chosen me. These apostles are asked to wait in Jerusalem for the anointing from on high before they can embark on the demanding, the daunting task of evangelizing. And you know that this pattern of waiting on God's initiative and then the appropriate response, that pattern is reflected in the composition of many of the New Testament letters. The first part, as you know, is almost all, in all of, almost all of them, is the so-called kerygma, the proclamation of what God has done. And then the second part, the DJK, the teaching, contains the demands, the obligations arising from the fact of God's prior action. But we have so frequently forgotten the sequence that God always and everywhere has taken the initiative and everything that we do subsequently, we do in response to what God has already done. Ours is meant to be always, therefore, a response of thanksgiving for what God has done. We have distorted our faith because we have turned it into a faith, a faith of grace, we have turned into a faith of achievement. A faith of having to prove ourselves. A faith in which we are needing to impress God. How we need to recover the sense of our intrinsic worth God again took the initiative to create us. God chose us to be God's children. When? Before the foundation of the world, proclaims Ephesians. Before we could have done anything to deserve or earn being chosen. It was a free gift. How we need to absorb and assimilate the fact of our being loved. God loved us. That is why God created us. God loves us now. And God will always love us unchangingly, unchangeably, forever and ever. We don't have to work ourselves into a frazzle to impress God. It is totally unnecessary and useless. It has been said, there is nothing we can do to make God love us more. Isn't that fantastic? There's absolutely nothing we can do to make God love us more, for God already loves us perfectly. A 
And do you know, there is nothing, absolutely nothing we can do to make God love us less. Isn't, isn't it fantastic? Nothing, nothing, absolutely nothing, sin included. <laughs> if anything, God seems to want to show precisely when, doesn't, doesn't St. Paul say, whilst we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. If Christ had had to wait until we're terrible for, Christ would have had to wait until the cows came home. <laughs> there is nothing, nothing that could ever happen to us and nothing that we could do to make God love us less. And so, dear friends, can't we begin to learn to luxuriate, to relax into our acceptance, to luxuriate into the acceptance of who we are, we whose worth is infinite. You, I, each one of us, we are each precious in the sight of God with a preciousness that cannot be computed. God carries me, God carries you in God's cupped palms. Your name is engraved on the palms of God's hands. You, I, each one of us, carried as something utterly, utterly precious as God cuddles us to God's breast. Precious as nothing else ever could be. So, so, how about being laid back? And you see, once we are able to do that, laid back, knowing, hey, I'm loved. I'm loved. I count. Then, 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 then we are able to accept our vulnerability, our vulnerability as an ontological reality that only God is ultimately invulnerable. That you and I are fundamentally contingent. We needn't have been. And that, and that God from all eternity, from all eternity, knew that there was going to be this crazy looking guy, Tutu, <laughs> from all eternity, before I formed you in the womb. I knew you. I knew you. You aren't an afterthought. You are part of my divine plan from all eternity. Can you, can you, can I, can, can we ever plumb the depth of this? None of us is an accident. We might some have some of us look like accidents, but uh, <laughs> none of us. Incredible, really. None 
Nano Fossi the next minute. We speak about, about the, you look and you say, well, no, no one is really indispensable. Yes. And yet, uh -uh, uh -uh. you are indispensable. You are unique. For one of my birthdays, my wife gave me a birthday card with a, with a, Gabby and Joan couple on the outside. The list that your spouse can give you for your birthday. Uh, and, and, and it said, we have a beautiful and unique relationship. Beautiful. And then I, I opened the inside and it says, I am beautiful. You are certainly unique. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I frequently trying to, 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 to make out that I knew a little bit of theology, uh, teaching, say, say to you students, have you, have you ever watched a, a symphony orchestra? You, you've got all these people dolled out in formal wear, carrying violins, cellos, oboes, and, and, and the conductor starts and, and all these have these wonderful sounds. And then in the back of the, of the orchestra is somebody with a triangle, <laughs> dolled out equally formally like everybody else. And now and again, the conductor will point to that person at the back and solemnly he will say, bing. <laughs> Yeah, it, it seems so insignificant, but in the conception of the conductor, of the composer, something irreplaceable would be lost if that thing didn't happen. <laughs> and, and so, we could have the most glorious worship and adoration in heaven. But if your being isn't there, something will be lost to the total beauty of that glorious worship. And God will be sad. And so you and I come to have to accept first that we are loved of incredible worth. Then that we are fundamentally contingent. That that is part of the meaning of being a creature. And then we won't try to play at being God, looking for a security that can properly belong only to God. Perhaps that is the gospel we should be preaching to the powerful, not to deny our creatureliness, our radical, ontological contingency, our vulnerability, a vulnerability that is because God is forever breathing God's breath into our nostrils, that we are kept in being only by the gracious action of God. You remain in being, I remain in being, only by God's continuing creative act. And it is all gift, all gift. Not something, not something for which I could ever strive meaningfully. It is all grace. And our response is meant to be forever and always. 
Eucharistic, that we are to be Eucharistic persons forever saying, thank you, God, for having taken the initiative to create me, to create us. Thank you, God, for continuing to uphold me in being, to accept the fact of my creaturehood, that by definition I am vulnerable. And let not this fill me with a deep anxiety and a deep sense of insecurity, which then makes me lash out, throwing my weight about. As part of saying it is a response, a response like a response to terrorism as of 9-11, when this remarkable place of worship had such a significant role. When we know we are loved, when we know that we matter, then out of that sense of worth, we would be more likely to see the worth of the other. And we would want to see that they lived worthwhile lives, lives of dignity, befitting those who are loved by God. Knowing that so-called wars against terrorism are unlikely to be won as long as people made in the image of this God live in degrading and dehumanizing circumstances, in conditions of poverty and deprivation, of squalor and disease and ignorance that could drive them to acts of desperation. <laughs> Here we are, waiting yet again on God to bless us, <laughs> but that's dangerous. Jesus waited and received the Holy Spirit. And no sooner had he received the Holy Spirit than it drove him into the wilderness to take on the devil. <laughs> you and I are going to receive God's incredible grace now. And then we are asked, go forth into the world to love and serve the Lord. Go out and make this world a more compassionate place, please. Go out and make this place a more gentle and caring place, please. Help me go out and make it a more caring, more sharing place. Go out, go out and make it beautiful for me. Sometimes students don't always know the right answers but they have a shot at the question in a scriptural exam the question was what did John the Baptist say to Jesus when he came to him to be baptized and this particular guy or Gaius didn't really know what's a little ignorance as between friends and so <laughs> he said well John the Baptist said to Jesus, remember, you are the son of God and behave like one. <laughs> Dear friends, remember, you are the beloved of God. Behave 